Today's daf is daf kuf. And we had left off yesterday with the Gemara asking um, regarding the status of a shaliach who is acting on behalf of the Asomim, selling off their real estate in order to pay creditors. We had established that if a woman uh, who's an almana, who's collecting her ksuva, does that, then even if she ends up shortchanging the sale, even by a dinar, that she sells it less, even by a dinar's worth, like a dollar's worth, of the estimated value of the real estate, the Yisomim can reverse the sale. They can, they can uh, nullify the sale. But the Mishnah had also told us that if the Bastin does a sale and they end up shortchanging the Yisomim, then they have a certain latitude, up to a sixth of the value. If they end up shortchanging the Yisomim, the Yisomim cannot come with recriminations to invalidate the sale. The question was, what's the status of a shaliach? He's not collecting on his behalf, uh, like an almana is, but he also doesn't have the power of a bastin. So the Gemara had said that there's two different ways of looking at it, and the final halacha says the Gemara that the hilchas a shaliach ka'almana, that we give the shliach the status of an almana, that even if he's off by a dollar or a dinar, we, the Yisomim have the power to invalidate the sale. So the Gemara's question now is, why are you being so strict on a shaliach? Why is it any different from the following Mishnah, which we saw yesterday? That the Mishnah had said yesterday when, we, when, a, when an, a landowner tells his shaliach, go ahead and take truma for me, and we know that there are different types of tithers. There are some who are the average tither who take a 50th for truma, 2%. And then you have generous tithers who take a 40th, and frugal tithers or stingy tithers who take only a 60th. And, and if the shaliach is not sure what the disposition <coughs> of the balabas is, he should just take off Bainanis. But then the Mishnah continues and it says, Piche Sasara Ohosif Asara Truma so Truma. That if the Shaliach gets it wrong, he thought the guy was very generous. And it turns out that he's quite frugal. So instead of doing what the Balabais wished, he gave a more Truma. The Mishnah says, nevertheless, the the Truma is binding and the Balabais cannot demand that the Truma be returned. So you see from here that we do give latitude to a shaliach. So why in this case do we give latitude to a shaliach? And yet you're telling me that in the case of selling land for the Yisomim, we give him zero latitude. The Gemara answer is, Hasum keven de'ika the torim ba'ayin ra'a, ve'ika the torim ba'ayin yafa, amar le'i lahachi amadeticha. Aval hacha ta'usahu, amar ta'usahu, amar le'i lo yiboi lach lemitoi. He says, the difference is, says the Gemara, is that in the case of Truma, the Shaliach, even though he got the uh, disposition of the Balabayas wrong, but he can nevertheless claim, I'm still within fair range of what, average, of what different people give. In other words, I didn't make any mistake as far as giving more or less than what people do tithe. But in the case of real estate, on a, on a completely objective level, I undersold the real estate. Even though I may have un- undersold the real estate by a dollar, but if the appraisal comes back as that it was worth a dollar more, then I've made a mistake. And therefore the landowner, in this case the Yisomim, can go back to the shaliach and say, you had no right to make an error. This is an, an abs- on an absolute scale, on a completely objective level, is a mistake. In the case of Truma, it's not a mistake because there are some people who give a 40th. So it is a fair amount to give. That's the difference. Amar of Hunabar Chanina, Amar of Nachman, Halacha Kedivrei Chachamim. So let's go back to the Machlokas that we saw yesterday in our Mishnah. Our Mishnah presents to us a Machlokas between the Chachamim and Rabbi Shimon ben Gamliel. The Chachamim say that while we give latitude to the Basedin, we only give them up to a sixth if they undercharge on the real estate. Um, and they get the price up, up to a sixth wrong. But if they go over a sixth of the value and, on undercharging on the sale, so then the Yisomim can invalidate the sale. Rabbi Shimon Gamliel had disagreed, and he said, no, they can even go beyond the sixth in undercharging for the real estate because in Cain, Makoch, based in Yafa, because you have to give 
a strength to the base then, and then by, and by limiting them to a sixth of latitude, you're sort of taking away their strength. So the Gemara now says, so basically Rav Nachman is quoted as saying that we paskin like the Chachamim, that they only have latitude of, a, of, of a, up to a sixth. So the Gemara says, V'lesle le Rav Nachman makoch based in Yafa. Since when does Rav Nachman hold that you restrict the power of the based in? It seems like he also says that we have to give a, a strong power to the judiciary, right? In other words, if we wanted to speak in legalistic terms. It's, yes? Aren't you impressing a, a, a summon? Isn't, isn't that a big uh, thing that the based in got the power to... Well, what do you mean oppressing them? What is well, that? The, the word oppression getting, could be a legal well, term and it could be... They're a, giving them, making for that they're getting less money than they might have gotten. Uh, yes, but, so. but, but at the same time, the based in, if, if they're stepping in to help Yasomim, you, you can't constantly be second-guessing them. There's a balance that has to be arrived at. The based in out of, you know, are acting on behalf of the community. So there comes a point where you can't second-guess them. You have to give them a certain amount of power. And so it's the question of how much power do you give them. Everyone agrees they have some degree of latitude, but, but uh, the, the Chachamim say they only have a sixth, and Rav Shimon Gamliel says they have full powers. Because as we'll see, the Beistin is acting with due diligence. There's a group of three of them. They're God-fearing men. So there, there really is no reason for us to suspect that they're acting in a malicious fashion. So the Gemara says, but doesn't Rav Nachman hold that we do give full strength to the Beistin? V'ha'amar Rav Nachman Omar Shmuel, Yisomim shabo lachlok avihen, Beistin ma'midin lehen aputropus uborin lechelek yafeh. That Rav Nachman quotes Shmuel as having said that let's say a man dies and he leaves over four sons and there's a big plot of real estate, then the halacha is that the based in should assign a, 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 an individual custodian for each one of these minor children, right, who don't have enough, you know, uh, uh, presence of mind to be able to enter into business negotiations themselves. And these custodians should act as the representatives of the Yasomim, and they'll negotiate among themselves what are the fair divisions of the property among the four sons. Okay? Now, Higdilu Yechon Limchos. But once the children become of age, if they're unhappy, if any one of the children is unhappy with the property that he received, then the Yasom has an opportunity to protest and to reopen the case and to demand a redivision. However, Rav Nachman Didei Amar Higdilu Ein Yecholon Limchos De Imkein Makoch Based in Yafe. But Rav Nachman says that's according to Shmuel. But I disagree with Shmuel, and I hold that no. Once the Basin has appointed these custodians, they are court-appointed uh, uh, representatives, and therefore you can't start hassling the Basin or their appointees. Once they negotiate in good faith, the case is binding, the case is closed, and the division is a division. And his argument is because we have to give strong powers to the Basin. So why is it over here that Rav Nachman advocates giving strong power to Beistin and not allowing for the case to be reopened? And over here in our Mishnah, he says, no, if the Beistin overcharges by a sixth, we can reverse the sale. The Gemara says, lo kasha hadetohu hadelotohu. The Gemara answers, it's a basic difference. Here, the Beistin has made an error in undervaluating the property and selling it for less than it's worth. And that's why the Yasomim have recourse. But in the case of where they appoint uh, custodians to negotiate, everyone's negotiated fairly, they've divided fairly, and that's why you can't reopen the case, says Rav Nachman. So, Well, I don't understand the whole premise then, says the Gemara. If they've divided the estate fairly, then what kind of protest could ever be made such that Shmuel allows them to reopen the case? The Gemara answer is Beruchos. Uh, the, the dispute or the reason for reopening the case is not because the Yasomim have not received equitable portions of the estate, but rather they could dispute, well, I wasn't happy that I got the east side of the estate. I was hoping to get the west side of the estate because the west side of the estate actually is closer to other properties that I own, and therefore I want to reopen the case. So Shmuel says you can, and Rav Nachman says you cannot. But the reason why Rav Nachman says you cannot is because since there was an equitable division, 
The based in can't be hassled and second guessed. It's just there's, they've, they're, their caseload is too heavy. And we have to have Rahmanus on the based in just like we have Rahmanus on the Yisomim. But in a case where the based in actually makes an, a mistake in valuation, even Rav Nachman agrees that you can uh, reopen the case and reverse the sale. Ki also Ravdimi Amar Maisa Vaasa Rebbe Kedivrei Chachamim Amar Lefan of Prata Benosha Rebbe Lazar Ben Prata Ben Benosha Rebbe Prata Hagadol Im Kain Makoch Based in Yafe Vehechsi Rebbe Es Hamaisa. Now Ravdimi had said over a story that had taken place uh, in a prior generation that a case came before Rebbe that the the Based in had sold the property for a lower price than they were supposed to. And Rebbe actually reversed the sale because it was there was a larger amount than a sixth less than the property was worth. And he reversed the sale, and he said the sale is null and void. Comes along a sage whose name is Prata, whose grandfather was Rav Prata HaGadol. And he says, in Ken Makoch based in Yafe, he lodges a complaint based on Rishim and Gamliel's argument that how can you take away powers from the based in? Based on Prata's argument, Rebbe changed his mind, and he said, no, the sale is binding. And we're going to allow the Basin's sale, even though it was undervalued, we're going to allow the sale to, to stand. Rav Dimi Masni Hachi, well, that's the way Rav Dimi had taught the story. However, Rav Safra Masni Hachi, but Rav Safra, when he related the story, he taught it as follows. That's not what happened. But rather, Maisa Ubikesh Rebbe Lasus Kedivrei Chachamim, Amr Lafan of Prata Benosha Rebbe Lazar Ben Prata Ben Benosha Rebbe Prata HaGadol, Based in Yafilo Asa Rebbe Asa that he says it's not that Rebbe actually nullified the sale and then changed his mind and substantiated the sale, but rather Rebbe was planning to nullify the sale because the base then had undercharged, and comes along Prata and says, How can you do that if Imkain Makoch based in Yafa, you have to give strong powers to the base then? And Rebbe therefore decided not to interfere and not to do anything. So the only difference in the, in the two accounts is that in the first way the story is related by Rav Dimi, Rebbe actually had initially nullified the sale, and then when the protest was lodged by Prata, he reversed his opinion. But in the second version of the story, Rebbe was planning to nullify the sale, but never actually did because of Prata's argument. So the question is, what difference does, the, what difference does it make in which version you subscribe to? Lema bahakam iflagi mar savar ta'a bitvar mishnah chayzer, Umar Sover Eino Chozer. Perhaps the Machlokas is, is a famous discussion in Maseches Sanhedrin. What happens if a judge makes an error in judgment? There are certain situations where if a judge makes an error in judgment and fines for the wrong party, then sometimes he himself has to make restitution because he should have known better. However, when it's Toa Bitvar Mishnah, there you have a discussion. What if there's an explicit Mishnah which the judge uh, goes against? Does he have to make restitution? Or do we say that, no, the ruling is binding, uh, and he can, he can just, or, or I, don't mean, I don't mean to say the ruling is binding, but we, we say that he can just reverse the ruling because it was such a blatant, a blatant error. So perhaps this is the machlokis, that Rav Dimi holds that you can reverse the ruling because it was such a blatant error. It was because of a Mishnah, because it says here in the Mishnah that according to Shimon Gamliel, in Kain Makoch, based in Yafis, so Rav Dimi says that even though Rebbe had originally decided to reverse the sale, he had a right to uh, change his mind and allow the sale to, to stand, based on the fact that it's a Mishnah that says that you have to give powers to the base then. And Rav Safra says, no, even though it's a, 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 an explicit Mishnah, you don't have a right to change the ruling once you've made the ruling, uh, because the Basin can't reverse its position. And maybe that's the reason why he changes the story, not that Rebbe actually had nullified the sale, but that Rebbe was planning to nullify the sale. The Gemara says, low. No, don't, don't, don't get so technical and scholarly on us. Dukuli al bidvar Mishnah Choser, because really in reality it could be that both Rav Dimi and Rav Safra both hold that Rebbe w- was perfectly within his right to change his mind, uh, that any time a judge makes an error in a, an explicit Mishnah, he can, he can uh, change his mind. However, Umar Savar Hachi Havamaisa, Umar Savar Hachi Havamaisa. 
And the only machlokas is what actually occurred. And each one had a different version of the story based upon what he had been taught from his Rebbe. So therefore, it's, uh, you, you can't necessarily adduce that there's a machlokas in Tabid Var Mishnah Choser or not based on the two versions of the story. Amar of Yosef, Armalta de Zavina Achrayas Ayasmi, who based in the Zavin Achrayas Ayasmi. Now we had seen this just the other day, we saw it on Daft Sadi Zion, that Rav Yosef says that if an Almana takes property of the Yasomim and sells it, and then it turns out that the property was encumbered because there was a lien on it from a prior creditor, and that creditor comes along and seizes the property from the buyer, then the buyer can go back to the Yasomim's estate and they would have to make good on the debt that is still owed to him. And the same thing is true that a Basin, if they sell the property, the same thing holds true, that a buyer always has a right to go back to the Yasomim in the event that the property that he purchases from the Basin sale turns out to be an encumbered property. So the Gemara says, Pshita, Almana, so the Gemara says, isn't that obvious? Like, why would I think anything different? Anytime you buy a property, you're buying a property with a chrayis, with, uh, with a guarantee that it doesn't have, <coughs> it doesn't have uh, anything encumbered upon it. There's no outstanding lien. So the Gemara says, Almana lo itztrichalei, ki itztrichalei beidina. The Gemara says, you're right. There's no chiddush in telling me that when the Almana sells the property on behalf of the Yasomim, the buyer can always go back to the Yasomim if someone takes away the property from him. The chiddush is that even when the Basin sells the property, then the buyer still has a right to go back to the Yasomim. Because mahu de teima, kol de zavin mi beidina adaita le meipak le kalahu de zavin kamash malan. Because you might have thought that really when you buy a property from a Basin's public auction, that well, maybe the buyer's thinking to himself, oh, I'm sure there's, this property is not encumbered, because if it was encumbered and it was such a public auction, the, the creditor would have come by by now and would have made a protest. The fact that no one has protested and we've been holding up this auction and we've been announcing it for so many days and no one's come forward, then surely the property is not encumbered. And you might have thought that even when a guy buys it, he's buying it as is without a warranty, because there's an assumption that he makes that the property is not encumbered, such that if the creditor would come along, maybe he wouldn't have legal recourse to go uh, collect from the assumption, because it's like, it's almost as if he said, I'm buying it with the assumption that it's not encumbered and I don't need any warranty, right? In other words, the public auction is warranty enough. So Kamash Malan, that we don't say that, and therefore if a creditor does come by and sees it, even after a Bastin's public sale, the buyer still has legal recourse. Let's go weiter. Rav Shimon Gamliel Omer V'chulei. Rav Shimon Gamliel had said that he disagrees with the Chachamim. He says, we give the Basin even more latitude than the Chachamim gave. The Chachamim only give latitude if the Basin undercharges for the estate up to a sixth. Rav Shimon Gamliel says they can even go more than a sixth because in Kain Makoch Basin Yafak, because we have to give strong power to the Basin. Va'ad Kama. So does Rav Shimon Gamliel have a limit? Like, what if they only sell it for a dollar and it's worth a million dollars? Like, what's, what's the cutoff for Shimon and Gamliel? Mm-hmm. So, Amar Rav Huna Bar Yehuda, Amar Rav Sheshes, Ad Palga, uh, up to a half, which means that if they undercharge the property up to a half of its value, the sale is still binding. But if they, if they charge less than a half of its value, so then the Yisomim, even according to Shimon Gamliel, can reverse the sale. Tanya no Mihachi, the Bryce actually says this, Amr B'Shim Gamliel, based in Shemachru Shava Masayim B'Mano, Shava Mano B'Masayim, Mechru and Kain. That if the Basin sells a property that's worth 200 for 100, or if they sell a property that's worth 100 for 200, in all those cases the sale is binding. But you notice that they're not prepared, that Rav Shim Gamliel is not prepared to go further than half of its value. It sounds like from this that if they take a property that's worth 200 and they sell it for 99, the sale will be null and void. Amar Ameimar Mishmei the Rav Yosef, based in Shemachru below Hachraza, Nasu Kemisha To Bidvar Mishnah Bechosr. So now uh, Ameimar says another statement. He says in the name of Rav Yosef that if a based in holds an auction, but they do not make it a public auction, they don't publicly announce it, then it is as if they have made an error in a Mishnaic teaching, and therefore they are allowed to change. They can, uh, the, 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 the sale can be rendered null and void. So the Gemara's first question is, Nasu vadaito. What do you mean 
that it's as if they made an error in a Mishnaic teaching. They definitely made an error in a Mishnaic teaching because we have an explicit Mishnah that none. Shom ha yesomim shloshim yom v'shom ha hektish yishim yom u'machrizen ba'bokir v'erev. The Mishnah says that when you sell property of Yesomim, you have to do a public announcement uh, in the town square for 30 days. And when you sell Hektish property, you do a public announcement for 60 days. And you have to make the announcement twice daily, once in the morning and once at night during that period of time when you're making the public announcement. So you see that it's an explicit Mishnah. How can you say that it's as if they made an error in a Mishnah? They did, they did make an error in a Mishnah. The Gemara answer is, mm-hmm. He says, if I only had that Mishnah, then you don't necessarily see that that Mishnah is talking about a based in sale. That Mishnah could be talking about a third party, singular shaliach, who's selling property on behalf of the Asomim, a broker, but not necessarily a based in. And maybe only d- does the Mishnah require of an individual broker to make a public announcement for 30 days. But maybe the base then doesn't have to make a public announcement. And therefore, that's why you need Rav Yosef's teaching to tell me that no, so too by a base then. And even though it's not explicitly taught in a mission, it's as if they made an error in a mission if they don't. So, Eisvei Ravashi la Memer. So, Ravashi challenges this psak. Look at our Mishnah. It says, Shom Hadayanim Shepach Sushtus Ausirushtus Mechren Batu. It says in our Mishnah that according to the Chachamim, if they undercharge by a sixth, then we can nullify. Uh, then we can nullify the sale. So hashava b'shava mechron kayim, which implies that if they sell it for a fair value, that is less than a sixth or equivalent to the property's true value, then the sale is binding. So my love the low achrus. So doesn't that imply that that's the only requirement that we make that they sell it for a fair market value? And there's no indication in our mission that they have to make a public announcement. So it sounds like that no public announcement is necessary. Isn't that a kasha on you, Ameymar? So he says, lo, bida achrus. No, even in the, in the reisha, even though it doesn't say so explicitly, it's implicit that the basin makes a public announcement, and if they sell it for fair market value, the sale is binding. But that's also a requirement that they have to publicly announce it. But wait a minute, hamid the seifa bida achrus, but one second, we don't get to this in the requirement that they have to make a public, a public announcement until we get to the seifa of our mission that we learned yesterday. The ketani seifa imasu igeres bikores afilu machru shavemana b'masayim shavemasayim b'mana mechron kayim. The Mishnah had said that even the chachamim agree that as long as a public auction is held, then you, the basin's error can even go beyond the sixth. They can undercharge even by a half, according to according to the Chachamim. So you clearly see that when you make a public auction or public announcement, the law of a sixth is not, is not binding. So when does the law of a sixth apply? It applies when they didn't make an announcement. So again, the kash is on you, Amemar. How can you say that the basin always has to make a public announcement? You see from our Mishnah that that's not true. So, Ela la'olam bidalo achros, velo kasha, kan bidvarim she machrizen alehem, kan bidvarim she ain machrizen alehem. The Gemara's answer is, you're right. When it comes to real estate, Basin does always have to make an announcement. But there are some kinds of commodities that are owned by the Yisomim's estate, which we're, where we don't require the Basin to make a public announcement. And that's what our mission was talking about when it says making an error up to a sixth. And what kinds of commodities that belong to the Yisomim do you not make a public announcement? when you're selling their servants, when you're selling their chattel, and when you're selling their promissory notes that are used for collections of debts that their father had. Now, why is it that you don't make public announcements for these three commodities? Avodim time amai shemayishmu v'yivrechu. Because uh, the servant, the reason you don't make a public announcement is because the slave who's being sold may hear about it, and he'll run away. Because no one wants to be a, you know, a slave is a slave. But what's even worse than being a slave is getting yourself sold on the market. Because you never know who you're going to get sold to. And the guy may get uh, uh, jittery and will run away. And why don't you make a public announcement when you're selling chattel or when you're selling promissory notes? The answer is, is because buyers will come by to ask to inspect them and someone will end up shoplifting. And will end up walking away and stealing them. So therefore we don't want the public to have 
to have view of these items, and therefore we, do, we, we don't publicly announce them. I'll give you another answer. That really, there are times when we do make public announcements. That's what Amemer was talking about. And there are times when we don't make public announcements, which is what our Mishnah was talking about. As the rabbis of Nahardah taught, that when you need cash, liquid cash, immediately, then you don't make a hachraza of 30 days like we normally require for Yisomim. What's a situation where you need liquid cash right away? Let's say the sheriff of Nottingham comes along and says, pay the, pay the taxes to the king, right? So you can't say to the sheriff, please, we need to make a public auction for 30 days announcement, and then we'll pay that. He's going to say, what are you talking about? He'll send his crusaders in, and they'll, sh- and they'll geshmet everybody. <laughs> so in that situation, you liquidate the cash immediately. You sell it to the first party that you can find to pay fair market value. And shoin ginik. And the same thing is true that if the yasomim or their dependents, like, a, like an almana, needs food, you can't say, give us 30 days. The people will starve. And third is for kavura, when you need to bury someone that the Yisomim have a responsibility to bury, either the, you know, uh, someone in the family, they have a responsibility to take care of their burial. So there too, you liquidate their assets immediately without doing a hachraza for 30 days. And that's where our Mishnah says that even when there was no hachraza, they have latitude, but only a latitude of up to a sixth. If in those cases they make a hachraza, they can be off even up to a half. The Ibai is saying, And another answer could be is that it depends on the Minagamakam. That some places there's a requirement for the based in to make a hachraza for 30 days, and in some places they don't make a hachraza at all, which is what our Mishnah was referring to. The Amr of Nachman may Olam la Asui Geras Bikaris bin Naharda. And Rav Nachman said that in Naharda they never do public auctions for Yasomim's uh, sales. So Sabrami na Mishum de Biki Bishuma. Some people originally thought that the reason why they don't do that in Naharda is because Rav Nachman held that the judges are such expert judges that there's no need for a public auction because we can rest assured that the Dayanim will get fair market value even without opening it up to the public. So Amalei Rav Yosef bar Minyumi lididimi farshali mineidu Rav Nachman mishum dekaru luhu b'nei achli nechsi da'achrazda. No, that's not the reason. When, you, uh, when I spoke to Rav Nachman about it, he explained to me that the reason is... <coughs> not because the judges in Naharda are any better than judges anywhere else, but because there was a certain ethic in Naharda, a certain sensitivity in Naharda, that they were very refined people. And it was considered to be crude or crass if a person were to exploit the assets of the Yisomim and be able to capitalize off of their need to liquidate their assets. In other words, you know, today... If you go ahead and you say, you know, I went to a police auction and I bought a drug dealer's car for, you know, pennies on the dollar, people don't think anything about it. They say, wow, what a metzia. But there's a certain sensitivity there. Like, do you want to be driving around in a drug dealer's car? And it's the same thing. Like, do you want to say, say to people, ah, those poor Yisomim, they had to liquidate some of their assets and I got, a, I got, a, I got it for a, a great deal. No one else knew about it, right? People, that's it's a little bit crass, you understand? In other words, there's a certain aspect of it where people are going to look at that guy and say, look at, look at Yankel, he capitalized on, on he took advantage of, uh, of the Yasomim's need to liquidate their estate. So therefore, in Naharda, they didn't make a public auction because it was a stigma to, to purchase, to, to, the, for the public to know that you were gaining some, uh, the Yasomim's uh, assets. Amar of Yehuda Omar, Shmuel Metaltalin Shal Yasomim Shaman Osan by the way, it applies today as well. You know, sometimes a person has to leave the community because he goes bankrupt. So you don't want to put up a big sign in the middle of the community saying bankruptcy sale, you know, for Yankel's uh, house, right? Uh, shah still, you know, you want to be able to save him the embarrassments. And so it's the same, same principle. Rev Yehuda says in the name of Shmuel Metaltel and Shal Yisomim Shaman Osun Amochron Osun Altar. Now Shmuel says that even though normally we make a hachraza, on the assets of Yisomim, but that's only true if they're not perishable. But if they're perishable metaltalin, so then you sell them off as soon as you can. Rav Chizda Amar Avimi Mochren Asan L'Shivakim. But Rav Chizda says, you know, sell it in the marketplace, because you'll get an even better price. 
Velo pligi, but there's no machlokas. They really both agree because ha de mikriv shuka, ha de merchak shuka. They're talking about two different cases. When the day of the shuk is very close and it's very easy to wait a day or two for the shuk day, then yes, everyone agrees you should take it to the shuk to get the best price. But if the day of the shuk is not coming, there's not going to be another shuk day for quite some time. So then everyone agrees you should sell it as soon as possible to the to the to uh, to the best buyer. Rav Kahana have a de shichra de Rav Misharshi bar chilkoi yasma shahai ad rigla amar afalgav de nafal be itzatsta maisi zuzah harifa. Mar tells a story about Rav Kahana, who was a custodian over the estate of a Yasam, who eventually became Rav Misharshia. And uh, there was a barrel of beer, but he decided that it was in the best interests in that particular case to delay the sale of the barrel of beer until the Yantif, because right before Yantif, everyone's buying lots of, lots of schnapps and lots of beer, right? So he therefore said, he says, even though the beer is going to start to sour a little bit if I wait until Yantif. I'll still get a better price by waiting because right before Yantif, money changes hands very freely. People are very, very spend, uh, of, what's the word? People are very effusive in their spending. So therefore, it, it makes more sense to wait, even though the beer may even depreciate in value somewhat. Ravina hava biyade chamra de ravina zuti yasma bar achde hava nami chamra have a kamasik le lesichra. So the, now the Gemara tells us another story that Ravina was a custodian over his nephew's estate, and in his nephew's estate, he was a yasom and he had a barrel of wine. Now Ravina also had his own wine that he needed to travel to a place called Sichra in order to sell. And the question that he asked Ravashi was, He said, would it be per- permitted for me to take the risk of my taking my nephew's barrel of wine with me because there's always a chance that the boat may sink and I may lose his asset? Is it permitted for me to do so? So I'm relay, zilo adif mididach. He says, of course it's permitted. He says, if you're willing to take the risk, if it's an acceptable risk for your own uh, merchandise, then it's an acceptable risk for the Yassim's merchandise as well. Okay, next Mishnah. There are three different kinds of women that our Mishnah is telling us are not entitled to a Ksuva. One is a Mima Enes, and it's a girl who got married as a katana without, where her father was previously deceased. We learned that that's a rabbinic marriage, that a girl can actually annul through the process of miyun. The reason why she doesn't get a ksuva upon the exit of the marriage is because it was she annulled the marriage, so that technically she was never married. The second case is a shniya. And a shniya is a woman who's rabbinically prohibited to be married. Let's say a man marries his grandmother. That's shniyos larayos. The Orisa, it's permitted, and therefore the offspring of that relationship, if they produce a child, is not puzzle in any way, but it's a rabbinically prohibited marriage. The reason why this woman is not entitled to a ksuva is because, and as we're going to contrast this with the seifa, we have to try and assess who convinced whom to get married. If the man convinced the woman, persuaded the woman to get married, then upon the divorce or death, she's entitled to a ksuva. But if the woman persuaded the man to get married, then because she's sort of the guilty, the more guilty party, she forfeits her ksuva. Now, in the case of now, how do we how do we make that determinant? It all depends upon what the product of that union is going to be. If the product of the union is going to be still kosher children, then we assume that it's the woman who initiated it and persuaded the man to get married because she has nothing to lose. Her children will still be kosher. But in a situation where the children of that union are going to be tainted in some way because it's a prohibited union which is going to create a mamzer or a halal or something like that, then we assume it's the man who initiates the marriage because a woman would never want to marry a man where she knows that her children are going to be tainted. A man may not care as much because he could always take a second wife and have kosher children, but a woman is going to be stuck. So therefore, in a case of Shneo, since the children are kosher, then we assume that the woman initiated the marriage. She's the, she's the temptress, so to speak, and therefore she forfeits her ksuva. And the third case is an islandess, and the reason why an islandess is not entitled to uh, a, uh, her ksuva is because it's a mekachtos. When the man married her, he thought she was capable of bearing children, and now that she's not, he divorces her, and therefore she leaves without a ksuva. 
Now, not only does she not get exuva, but the Mishnah also says she doesn't get peros, mizanos, and blos. What are those three things? Peros, we know that a husband has a Kenyan peros. He can consume the produce off of her nichse milug, off of whatever real estate she brings into the marriage. But the Mishnah had also told us that in exchange for the husband's Kenyan peros, he is chayef bepirkona. He has to redeem her if she ever gets kidnapped. He has to pay for her ransom. However, let's say a husband discovers my wife is an islandess, and therefore I'm exempt from ransoming her. So she gets kidnapped, and she sends him a telegram and says, you need to ransom me. He says, no, you're an islandess. I don't owe you anything. So then when she, finally she gets redeemed from her family, she comes back. You imagine, she's pretty upset. She comes back. And she says, okay, I'm ready to get a divorce. The husband says, you're not entitled to the ksuva. And I didn't have to ransom you, because you're an islandess. She says, well, then give me back all the peros. No, the husband does not have to give her back the peros. Whatever he consumed already, he's allowed to keep. That's what the mission is telling you. The next thing is mizonos, is that she can't demand to be paid once it's discovered that she has any of these conditions. And the fourth thing is blaos, which is whatever clothing or wardrobe she brought into the marriage, which we call nichseit zon barzel, she's not entitled to recover upon the termination of the marriage. These are all penalties that are placed upon the woman for entering into a marriage that either was a annulled marriage, a mekachtos marriage, or a forbidden marriage. And im mitchilin esal l'shem islandis yesh l'ksuva. If, however, in the case of the islandis, if he married her knowing that she was an islandist, then he, cl- he can't claim mekartos after the fact, and therefore he, she's entitled to aksuva and all of the other accoutrements to the aksuva that we've just mentioned. Almana, now we contrast it with the following women. Almana lekohen gadol, grusha v'chalutza lekohen hedjot, mamzeres unesina li Yisrael, bas Yisrael unesina lo mamzer, yesh lahem ksuva. Now these are all forbidden marriages. However, in this situation, since the offspring of this forbidden marriage is tainted in some way, in the first two cases it's a chalal, in the last two cases it's either a nesin or a mamzer, therefore we assume that the man initiated the marriage, he was the tempter, not the woman, and therefore upon termination of these marriages, the woman is entitled to the ksuva. So the first two cases, if a kohen marries a grusha or a chalutza, or if a kohen gadol marries an almana, the last two cases is where either the man or the woman is a mamzer, and that's it, or in the sin, a Samaritan or some other kind of person who does not have the status of a kosher Jew, in those cases, since the child will be tainted in some way, the, the woman does get her ksuva because she was pers- the, the tempted party, the persuaded party, and not the temptress. Let's go with the Gemara. Rav Tani, Ketana Yotza Beget, Ein Laksuva, Bechol Shekein Mima Enes. Now, Rav says that any time a girl is a Ketana who does not have a father, and there's only a rabbinic marriage, it doesn't matter how the marriage terminates. It could either terminate through Mian, or it could terminate through a Get. But in all cases, the girl does not get a Ksuva because it was never considered to be a bona fide marriage midiraisa. And the rabbis only awarded a ksuva to a girl who has a biblical marriage, not to a girl who just has merely a rabbinic marriage. However, Shmuel Tani Shmuel disagrees. He says the only time a katana does not get a ksuva is if she's the initiating party by annulling the marriage by doing miyun. But if the husband initiates the termination by giving her a get, she's entitled to a ksuva, even though it was only a rabbinic marriage. Ba'az the Shmuel letaime, and Shmuel is consistent. The Omar Shmuel mima'enes ein laksuva, because he had said in a different context that if a girl does me and she forfeits her ksuva, but yotze beget yesh laksuva, but if she's a katana and she's divorced by her husband, she does get a ksuva. He further said, mima'enes lo paslo min ha'achen velo paslo min ha'kohuna, that <clears throat> if she does me and, since the marriage is retroactively annulled, she's allowed to marry her husband's brothers because she was never really married to her husband. And similarly, she's allowed to marry a Kohen because she was never halachically married before. However, Yotza beget psula mina achen upsula mina kahuna. However, if the husband divorces her, so then she's a divorcee. So she's not allowed to marry his brothers because she's an ex sister in law, even rabbinically. And she's not allowed to marry a Kohen because she's a rabbinic divorcee. <laughs> and furthermore, he said, <laughs> And finally, a girl who does miyun. Now, any time a girl's marriage terminates when she's a katana, we know for sure that she's not pregnant. The rabbis nevertheless required that any time you exit a marriage, you have to wait what's called the Yemei Havchana, the three months, to determine that you're not pregnant from the previous marriage because we, we always want to note that we can trace 
the ancestry of the child. Now, in this situation, if she does mion, so retroactively, it was never a marriage, we don't require her to wait this standard three months before she remarries. But if she got a get, even though we know she's not pregnant, still the rabbis made a low plug. They made an across-the-board the, 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 across rule that since she exited a marriage, she has to wait three months. So the Gemara now asks, my kamash Tanina kulu. So why did Shmuel have to teach this? This is all already previously taught in a Mishnah. So what Shmuel's teaching is superfluous. Because it says in a Mishnah, in Yevamos, that it says explicitly that if a girl does mion, she's allowed to marry her, her husband's relatives, and she's allowed to, ma- and he's allowed to marry her relatives. She's allowed to marry a, co- a kohen, but if he gives her a get, then she becomes usher to his relatives, and she and, and he to hers, and she can't marry a kohen. So why does Shmuel have to teach that? The Gemara answer is The answer is you're right. Shmuel didn't need to teach the first things on the, on his list because that's explicit in a Mishnah. But his chiddush is the idea of does she have to wait three months or not? And that's where he wanted to make sure that we knew the halacha, that if she does miyun, she doesn't have to wait three months. But if she gets a get, she has to wait the three months. And we'll continue tomorrow. Have a wonderful day.